this, and the reason I also show it is, it was uh, I worked for this company called Urban Salon, and it was it was called for some reason Urban Salon Architects, and it had one architect in it. When I turned out, it had two. So it's really it, this idea of this protecting the word architect is very daft when you can just have one person in it and it makes everyone in supposedly. Uh, but it was full of uh, furniture designers, uh, graphic designers, filmmakers. Uh, interior architects, interior design. My other half was the director of this company, one of the directors. And um, but what's interesting about was interesting when I normally used to show people this is don't ever promise something you can't deliver. Because what what happened with this is there was a competition, and it was a competition by um, the design museum. And what they did in the local area. Um, I don't think we're going to get snipped of it, but what they did was, in the local area, was they went and sat down at local pubs around Bermondsey, uh, where a lot of people go to, it's quite working class around there, quite tough, pub, home, pub, home, um, and they found that they all missed the bingo hall, so they combined with the housing, of social housing, a bingo hall, and there's a thing, whatever you do, you'll find that um, Tesco's do this, and, and big companies, when they build here, they used to have a little agreement with the local authorities, which was, you let's build the, like, like Tesco, what it was, what it generated with Tesco's, which was, Tesco's would say, we're going to put this big superstore out in, uh, out, outside your town, but what we'll also do is pay for all the roads to it, the car park, and we'll do up the children's playground, we'll give you money to play. And, this sort of agreement with local authorities became a formal piece of documentation called a Section 106. So basically every developer that develops somewhere pays some money to a local council to fund something for the local council. And it's up to the local council what they normally spend that on. And they normally have to answer the local authority. So if someone came down your road and said, we're going to knock down this big block of flats, you'll probably find 10% of what they're spending will be given to the council as a sweetener, as a section 106, to develop something in the community, okay? So this, what it was, was they are doing this massive housing scheme in Bermondsey, and their section 106 was to do a little bit of social housing and this bingo centre on this small block. Now the guy who ran this job, uh, the guy who was the director of architecture on this job, did two fatal mistakes. One was um, he ignored advice he got. The other one was he promised the client that he'd get the, the client planning permission. And so he said to the client, you pay me and I will get you planning permission. Now the funny thing that happened with this is, well it's not funny, uh, the client normally gives you a bit of money uh, and you pay for planning permission from that money. You get the client to pay it. And he writes a cheque to the local authority to pay for the local authority to check the drawings and prove them. Because he'd made this promise, it meant every time they didn't get planning, he, uh, the company had to repay the planning submission fee. And also, any new work it did, it did at its own cost. So the client didn't have to pay any more money. He said, no, you gave me a figure, I think they gave me a figure. You gave me a figure of £25,000 that I'm paying you to get me planning permission on this. The fact that you have to resubmit it 12 times is your fault, not mine, because you told me you would get me planning permission on this, and you haven't. So you never say that. You say, I, if you anyone ever asks you to do something that requires a decision by someone else, of course, literally, you say, I will take it to the planning submission, and I will submit it, and that's when my, I stop. If it gets planning... Great, it should do, but if it doesn't, it's not my fault. We've done so. I will take it to that stage. So this guy made the silly mistake of promising to get it, okay? And the other thing was of not consulting people properly. Uh, and he constantly, the company constantly spent more and more, 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 more money. Most planning, most design access statements are five key things. There's something like context, um, building size, materials relationships to the community, things like that. You go on a, a website called K, and you if you just type in design access statement, they, they give you a PDF that literally tells you what they want. Now this sort of document should be a couple of pages thick. And all you're showing is intent, because it, it's not actually even got, 
you've not even gone to a thing that they call building control, which is, this is the about type, location, and kind of building, or space you're doing. To then make it compliant is, um, you have to go to building meg submission, make sure the staircases are wide enough for fire exits, make sure the buildings are not, uh, you, the disabled access into it, make sure that uh, the lighting level's correct, make sure that you're, you know, you're complying to heat loss and, and environmental things. That's, that, that's another stage away. So this is just like saying, listen, Mr. Planner, I'd like to put an X sort of thing in your, 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 your uh, town, um, and here I am proving why it needs to happen. So I'm going to go through what they, what they did, OK? So they always did these nice InDesign reports. We've got a graphic designer to lay them out, and they always did them. Um, so, yeah, there we go. So they did an introduction and they did these little sketches. And these were sketches which, which have no, um, uh, what's the word, uh, they're ideas. They're as good as the sketch next door by uh, Sean or, or one of the other boys. So this is just a location thing. And this was the big development that's going on over the other side of the road. The funny thing is, you had to get this small, little section 106 housing thing um, built and signed off to enable that to be approved so people could move into it. So you can imagine this small little house with small little Bermondsey housing we're doing, which I think has got about uh, 15 flats in it. <clears throat> if not, if it doesn't get approval, can hold up the whole development because it's one job lot, you don't go for small plan. You know. So this is getting built, this has already got planning approval, on the agreement, it's like, on the, it's like someone saying to you, uh, I'll go out with you as long as you get your hair cut. Now, that means you can go out, but uh, you won't go out again unless you get your hair cut. Now the idea is, they'll give you planning permission, you can build all this housing, but you have to get this bingo board, this little social housing signed off and built as well. And of course, by the, these designers not getting it right, when this came up, every time that's sitting there unoccupied or not being able to, or, or, or you've sold the apartments but you can't let people move in, it's costing money. It's costing more money than just the bloody planning application. So technically, they could have started too. So this is just like a site plan. And you do this, or the description of the site and the content. Here we are, talking about housing. No, nothing to talk about. Talking about volumes. How you see it, how you approach it. It's just talking about a basic thing about site and its content. In context. And these are some diagrams, because what we found, good old London, um, the, the Romans, a uh, load of Roman foundations and walls underneath. Uh, London's quite uh, bored of Roman things. So basically, Lon modern London sits a bit on top of Roman London. Um, all they ask is you don't uh, disturb the foundations. So they excavated around all the, the Roman foundations. We highlighted them. And then you have anything that's structural needs to go in, goes around the Roman foundation. So, so far, this is just roughly showing what we're showing to these people, really, by this report. And what you're trying to show with any report, even your pitches that you might give Aberrant or Simon or anything like that, is you're trying to show people you've got to have the confidence in you to let you carry on doing what you want to do. That's the same with this. You, you, it's not about being pragmatic. It's not about being truthful, honest, and absolutely everything like that. This whole document is about saying to someone, look what we know, look how you can trust us, look how honest we're being. So it's really kind of like that in a way as well. So yeah, we, this is the Ordnance Survey map of the building. That's the site. This is the first stage of this massive housing on the corner. This is little small local housing. That has no contacts to that. I mean, that's six, eight stories high. This is two up, two down. This is Brookside. And that's that's and that block. Uh, and then this is showing um, a little bit about the planning history of it. Um, and this was the competition. And they won the competition purely based on these two drawings. Um, one was how they changed the block around it to the bingo hall and housing on top, bingo hall down there. And they did this little collage, which
which shows the centre of London, or the centre of London, of central London, and its relationship to, because this thing was right near London, uh, Tower Bridge, right around the corner from the Design Museum. Bermans is on the road to that. So they did these little drawings. I think they did one other one, actually. If it, yeah, they did this visual. That's the visual for the, the, the competition that they know they're going to build. And so this is what they want it with. Um, what this shows, and this is interesting, this is the model evolving. And this is saying every time they talk to the planner, and every time they're slow, because planning law changes a lot, like Boris Johnson at the moment has said bedrooms and apartments need to be a certain size. Ken Henderson had a different viewpoint. So you've got them policies changing. So here they are, and this is a typical architect for you. They don't need to be explaining these sort of things. They don't really need to be talking about these things for Dr. Moore. All they need to be talking about is the shape and the area. That's all they need to talk about. They need to say there's 15 bedrooms in there, certain amount for singles, certain amount for family. Each bedroom has a certain area, so it meets the code. And this is the volume, and this is how it relates to context. But this architect's getting obsessed with what it looks like. You know? Here we are. Suddenly, as you can see, they've, they've not looked at the properly the planning law there. You can see the shape has had to be slightly changed. Then they went to see the planner again, and he changed it a bit more. Then they took out the first one, put two stories here and that there, and then they've changed it even more. So all the time, uh, the thing's changing because of the planner. So yeah, they have to show the kind of evolution of the scheme. Here we go, this is the context again, massing principles, this is why it's this high. As you, keep, you see, you've got the stupidity of Mr and Mrs Smith who've lived in Bermondsey all their life, got a nice little front garden, parked the car out of there, suddenly got a nice big thing, suddenly got another big thing right over the road. So Bermondsey to them. So this is just a simple report, and uh, some photos. I mean, I do like the way um, Urban Sound do things, you know, they, straight statement, then the specialism, few little captions, and they always have their, this is their kind of master copy, so they always just drop things into it. Um, then this is a sketch of the proposal. As you can see, the roof is the same colour as the tree, so obviously it's very green. Um, then this is the local context, again, shows another elevation of a building that might be around the corner. Um, just shows some photographs of it, talks about that. Um, what you might see from the other side of the road. It's a hand sketch done in Photoshop. And then this is the details and materials. So there's no detailing going on at the moment. No one's actually worked out the total thickness of the walls. So underneath the space, it might look like this. That green thing on the roof is, might look like that. The brick course that might be on the side of the building might look like that. The bit around the other side of the building, which is white, might look like that. And the kind of appearance of it with the holes and, and things in the enclosure, just like that. So this is all just pinched off um, the, uh, off the internet, out of magazines. I mean, if you're really crafty, what you do is you go around and fo photograph buildings in the local area. Because they've already been improved. So you can say this idea of context. Look, that one over there that you like has got, got triangular shaped windows. So shouldn't be so bad you approving the meat out trying to shape windows because you have set a precedence. So yeah, so that's the proposed materials. And you do this really funny thing called flood risk. The idea is you have to show that uh, if, if there was a flood, if it would affect the site, because we were near the tents. Things about environmentalism, sustainability, just some key issues. This is like uh, maybe using hot water systems that are different. Um, and you go through each category, there's these categories, so you go through this category of waste, pollution, these are all key headings they give you. So they ask you basically just to fill out a visual questionnaire. This is what this is. And then you do kind of like shadow analysis, because there's this object now being stuck there. One of the key things in, in, in London is a, a thing called rights of light which means someone can't build a building right in front of your bedroom window. Your window has a right of light for you to have a certain amount of light come in to that space. And it's normally, uh, there's a certain couple of 
angles, so you project out of certain things at 45 degrees and someone can't put a building that actually sits within that unless they offer to buy your rights of flight off for you. It's really interesting, this right of flight aspect exists for you and it can be a commodity. You can say, it's okay, I'll let you build in front of my window for 20 grand. Give me 20,000, you can have my rights of flight and build in front of it. So, as you can imagine, uh, we had to prove that we weren't going to take anyone's right of light away. So you do a series of shadow models. And then um, this is the, uh, a rough description of how it might work, the building. Again, we're not actually talking about how it will work. We're just talking about the fact that, yeah, when, when you get hot, open a window. When in the summer, you've got air conditioning. Uh, oh, we're going to use natural ventilation. Of course, you can't use natural ventilation. One of the big issues we had on they had on this building was you you can't ask someone to open a window to ventilate it near a noisy road where they'll get sound pollution, noise pollution. So we had to seal all the windows up and work out a different way of ventilating the space because of sound pollution. Um, and then this is what they really are after they. If you're a planner, you don't need to show them all this stuff. As I said, you don't need to show them all these buildings and everything. You can just show them a volume. You could show them that material palette. And then you just schedule of accommodation. You could literally hear what this does, which talks about the sizes of spaces and number of people that can occupy those spaces. There's a general law that you can't build a house or get approval on a property uh, which contravenes the housing guidelines. So, for example, me and my other half at the moment are building our, trying to build our own house that's around the corner from here, not far from this place in Bermondsey. Uh, we're not allowed to choose the size of the bedrooms. We have to conform to a regulation in that bedroom. We could say, actually, we like living in cupboards, so I'm really happy to live in a, a two and a half metre by one metre space for a bedroom. Um, but I would be breaking the law in terms of guidelines and regulations because there's rooms that have to be certain sizes. The idea is you design something personal for yourself. You can only do that if it's flexible, if they're seen as installation-y bits. So I couldn't make a room that size. I could make a bed that size. Your phone's ringing. Is it? <laughs> no, it's probably someone saying, this is a talk on today. So, and then these are just some of the supporting things. So that's like a summary introduction. You pay someone to do the site analysis. And this is someone who basically dropped your building into um, a computer program that worked out the sun path, how much light's coming in. Uh, so that's that document. Then there's location drawings, which are you have to have, generally on, on something, you have to have, there's a series of drawings that are council drawings, so you things like a an ordnance survey map, a plan, a Google Earth plan, something like this. Um, and you also have to have a thing called utilities. Basically it shows where the gas is, shows where the electricity is, shows where the sewers are, and so you get those. So all the time, this is uh, just modelling the building again. You know? More daylight analysis. As you can see, these are the poor people who live around, around the building. And you do shadow analysis. This is the idea of doing um, an analysis that, again, you don't get rid of someone's rights to life. So this is you proving to someone that you're not going to do The fact that they don't look at it would be... Is, is quite interesting. They don't actually go through each drawing to make sure. You have to make a statement that you don't affect someone's life. They don't check that you don't. They're expecting you to be honest and say this. So all this information is just to back up your statement that you're saying we don't affect the rights of life. As you can see, it's lots of beautiful images for them. Um, and there's, as I said, there's this law on, on housing. And there's this thing called the Code for Sustainable Homes. Um, it's really funny because designers used to do this now, but engineers do all these, these reports. Um, 
and this is done by a company called Fabian Walsall, and they they prove the environmental performance of the property. They tell you how much heat it loses, how much heat it will gain, solar gain, um, how much ventilation you get in, in it. It's, so again, it's showing a property or space um, and you're looking for, what, what it is is basically you, 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 you tick a box of conditions. So you get a point if you do this, another point if you do that, two points if it's got this in, four points if it's made of sustainable this, six points if you've used natural ventilation instead of other. So this kind of just goes through and ticks everything off. Make sure that you're conforming to sustainable requirements for housing. And I think we might have some. Yeah, so this is the thing about building services. You pay an engineer to explain how your building services roughly work. And again, he's... He's only explained, this is the sort of thing he was saying would talk about, you know, get up and turn the light on and off. Stuff like that, isn't it? Um, so this is just very basic, talking about um, how much electricity you use, how much electricity you save by your building design or your space design. And then you have a thing called fire strategy. Now you're going to see some, this, you might see some drawings in this. What's interesting about fire strategy is, I know we all put things in to get out of a building, but the new thing is the, um, the idea that you engineer uh, a thing. I, I worked on this building, um, well, you probably all know, I worked on Stansted Airport when I was at my year out at Foster's. Um, and what they proved there was people generally don't run towards fire exits, they run the way they come in. Uh, most people... Like, do you know where your nearest fire exit is? Yeah. Because oh, you walk past it when you come in. <laughs> around about, it's your nearest fire exit is there. Yeah. Most of us, I'd run out that door, go out the same way I came in. I normally run out the front door if anything's on fire. I wouldn't look for fire exit. Um, and they kind of, when I was working in Stantop, they proved the fact they didn't need fire exits because uh, in an airport, everybody runs out the way they come in. You'll either run out the arrivals or the departure doors. You won't go looking for fire exit. So they. Um, but what's interesting about fire strategy is you you kind of you show uh, you meet certain requirements. And think. So again, your there's a certain six list. You talk about means of escape, which is distance from it. Out of, that there's no materials that are flammable. Um, that. You won't get the old Kurt Russell um, backdraft of a flame spread across the product. Uh, how you manage it. And then we did some, draw this is them working out some drawings. So they're showing what the rating of each wall is. Uh, you do this thing in a building which is called uh, installation and integrity. Um, installation and integrity. Uh, when you get a product, like this door here is a fire door. And the reason it's a fire door it's because it's got closure on it, so you shouldn't be allowed to leave it open. And it's got these sort of things on it. A normal door, like your door at home, won't have these on, unless it's a fire door. And this fire door, is, this is a, a, a brush and a seal, and the door is designed the way it is, to stop fire getting through it and smoke getting through it. And the other thing is, um, so this fire door will have ins insulation and integrity, and the insulation is, there's a fire on the other side, um, and it has to have a rating, this is an interesting thing, that while it's burning on the other side, there's a certain agreed time before this door starts getting hot. So the idea is, if you had this door and it was 60 minutes, you get these ratings in time, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 2 hours. If this had a rating of 30 minutes, by the guidelines, while that fire is burning on the other side of that door, for 30 minutes I can put my hand on it without burning it. 31 minutes it might go like, but it has to have that. So the insulation idea is the fact that you're protected in this space, the fire is on the other side and you can't burn your hand. And then the other one is integrity, which is, again, if it's 30 minutes or so and so, which is... After that 30 minutes, this door, before the 30 minutes, mustn't have the ability to fall apart. It's got to have integrity. So as soon as it, um, as soon as it goes past those 30 minutes, it could fall apart. 
that's fine. But so if you have this fire door here, which is 30 minutes insulation, 30 minutes in tickle tea, it means for 30 minutes it can't fall apart. For 30 minutes, for 29 minutes, you could go. I think we better go in a minute because in about a minute this this door's going to start, you know, getting a bit hot and falling apart. So you've got an idea that you're in a protected space. And they normally put smoke seals on things as well. Uh, this one uh, this isn't a smoke seal. This is like a little strip of rubber. And what happens when it gets warm, it, it expands. So the seal stops the smoke coming in. That won't stop the smoke coming in, as we all know, because what it would do is have a thing called um, brushes on the floor. Believe it or not, it's this little strip of like fake eyelashes strip that goes down the bottom that stops the smoke coming in. So, yeah, and uh, I think they've actually got the guidelines on the door. So, what you get is you get this set of drawings which explain this sort of idea that certain... This is all very uh, strong fire performance. I think I'm going a bit on about fire performance, but anyway. Because um, you normally do around plant rooms and anything where you might get things on fire, a large fire rate. And then you have these ones, which green is a lot, a lot weaker and the blues are the stronger ones. And so this is just a set of sketches by someone of, of the building. Not as it's even actually going to be built, but to give the fire guy a location of where, which walls are going to be what. So they're, they're very simple. And then some basic sections saying, well, most things have a heavy fire rating or, or stuff is, is because you don't want them to fall down. The idea is you can stay in that space, there might be a fire. You don't want the building to suddenly collapse like gone with the wind. It's, it, it has this sort of integrity to it. And so, I mean, what I'm trying to show, what I was trying to show you, if I go back over, is in it, you've not really seen any drawings or design or stair widths or, or, or details or anything. What you've seen is um, it's probably less, you'll probably get, a, probably get a 55 with lava if you did a series of drawings like this for the project. But most of these drawings are, um, are all you need to get started on a project or to get planning permission on a project. And as you can see there's competition winning schemes, this, that shouldn't even be in there. And so the idea of of the information you even need to start building something it doesn't even involve designing it, it's just in, it's related to its shape, its volume and its context. And I just want to show you it also because I just thought these are the sort of things that Avran are yapping on about they want from you. Some pictures around the site, a bit of Google Earth, a bit of context, a bit of history, is there a bit of archaeology? Lots of volumes around it. It was really interesting. Thank you. Sure. And um, a bit about the planning history and some doodles. You could say literally you've got to do a sort of semi planning submission to Aberrant, but with research. So that's 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 a uh, and that is an overly written um, planning report. If I show you, uh, I'll, I'll just show you another one actually, while I'm at it. If you go online. This is everything you need to do to get a building built. And it's it's this PDF of a, of a design access statement. Let me see if we can read it. We're getting there. And it's basically a document, it's quite long and exhaustive, but tells you all the headings you need to write, all the ones you need to, to fill in. document, as I said, is basically a 
and what you need to show. Use, ego. Use, amount, layout, scale, um, landscaping, and appearance. And it doesn't really ask you to do any drawings at all. So really you're just explaining and then it shows here. I mean if you actually if, if you if you are going if you are going to do anything on site um, on site for your project, like the site you've chosen, I would get one of these and use it as a guideline, because it basically is what you do on the site. Don't think of it like a, yeah, I blindfolded myself and I just wandered around and I smelt the area and I could feel this. You don't think of it that way. Think of it as quite pragmatically like this. And it just tells you what to look at, really. A short look. I mean, it tells you everything you're meant to do in a report. The great beauty of this is, of course, um, the, uh, the inability of an architect in most of the practices I've worked in to actually just follow this and do it without being giving too much information. There's a real balance what you need to do, which is to get... This is almost like a pitch to a local authority. Well, it is a pitch to a local authority. You don't need to show them everything. You only need to show them what they need to see or know. So it's got this thing about scale. It talks here about the drawings you could show for scale. Actually, you can show you them. Landscaping, what you're going to put in the public realm. To ask you, tells you things that it would like to see you talk about. Um, Appearance. Oh, how does it look down my eye street? Oh, my windows might look the same. So you could, you know. Uh, access, how you get into it, around it, and then it goes back here. And then it tells you how you read them. How they read them. What they're looking for when they read it. And then it tells you about the process. So, this is the process. This is what we're looking for in use. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll um, I don't talk anymore, stop now. Uh, I'll load those up for you, those two lots of statements. The one by Urban Salon and this one by Kate. Because um, it's pretty useful, pretty straightforward. <laughs>